Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight for Advanced Native Political Leadership. We are We Belong Here series. We started this series here in 2021 really to highlight Native American political leaders. We Our inaugural 2021 guest was Christina Haswood. And she talked a lot about what it was like to run and win and now serve an elected office. And we've been hearing a lot about the political appointments in this Biden administration, um, which is probably one of the most uh, diverse uh, 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 landscape that we've seen that for an administration to have. And so we're joined by uh, Jody Archambault, who's a former appointee herself. Let me do a little introduction with you, Jody. Jody, uh, coming in from North Dakota as well, serves as a strategic advisor right now. She had previously served under the Obama administration, and during her tenure under the administration, Jody served as a special assistant to the president for Native American affairs for the White House and for the White House Domestic Policy Council, as well as the deputy assistant secretary to assistant secretary in Indian affairs at the Department of Interior, and separately as the White House Associate Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. Thank you, Jody, for joining us. I know there's a lot going on. Um, welcome to our Facebook Live series. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure to plan this, and I'm excited to get to the business. So thank you for having me. <laughs> We appreciate your time. So tell us, uh, what was it like leading up to your working with the Obama administration? What were you doing that caught the attention of President Obama that put you in the role of senior policy advisor for Native American affairs? Well, I just want to say that, um, first of all, I, I came in not as the senior advisor for Native American affairs. That was a position that he had promised on the campaign trail. It was in the Domestic Policy Council. I came in um, leading the intergovernmental affairs work with the Indian tribes in 2009. So I was one of the, I was the first um, native political appointee and I came in right off of the campaign. So as many people know, you really get your, I guess, credentials working the campaign. And when I was um, working for a nonprofit in North Dakota, I worked for Native American Training Institute for about for about 12 years. And at the end of those 12 years, I was the executive director. And um, I just, I got, um, I guess, drank the Kool-Aid with President Obama because he was talking about things in his policy platform that resonated deeply with me. And um, it wasn't very typical for a presidential candidate to be talking about things like uh, native preser preserving native languages or closing the jurisdictional gap for um, for Native women on res um, and looking at ways to increase the protections that are available um, for people who are in domestic uh, situations where, the, where it's dangerous or lethal. Um, so the specificity of his policy platform was really what caught my eye. And I got um, interested and then he went to Crow. And I think I was doing a training up in um, Alaska when, when he went to Crow and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go knock on doors for this man. And so I started um, finding out how I could get involved and volunteer. Um, the very same week I was gonna go to my home community where I grew up in Pine Ridge um, to Kyle, the week that I was planning to go there, Hillary Clinton actually visited my hometown. <laughs> and that was his main opponent, opponent in the primaries. And so I had to shift my focus else, elsewhere. Um, long story short, I ended up joining the campaign for a couple of months. And the, uh, the organizing that we did, I became the director for Native American, or actually director of First Americans Get Out the Vote in North Dakota. And I worked closely with tribal leadership and I guess um, big players in, in terms of who you go to for different support. Uh, on a political campaign <clears throat> and basically just ran it more or less like a, um, a candidacy for tribal chairman or tribal councilman. My family has been long involved in tribal politics at home. My dad served on tribal council. My brother served on tribal council and eventually served as chairman of our tribe. And so I said, well, why don't these um, presidential campaigns look more like a tribal campaign? And so we looked at the numbers, we were very analytical about how we were gonna reach our targets. Um, I was able to add staff, I was able to hire good people. Um, Renee Gourneau up in Turtle Mountain. Um, I, I hired Melissa Brady from, she was at Spirit Lake at the time. And 
then I worked closely with people like Janet, um, Janet in, at, you know, down in Standing Rock and Janet Alkire. And um, we just did, you know, get out the vote door to door. And our strategy was really around talking to people face to face and getting as many people to volunteer to talk to people face to face and then doing a lot of um, ride coordination and, and such. Um, but partway through that, that tenure in, um, in the position as a, an official um, employee of, of Obama for America, um, he pulled out of North Dakota and I was offered a position to go with the team that was moving out of North Dakota. Palin joined the, um, the ticket for McCain and that changed the polling numbers in North Dakota. Bra Barack Obama was rising. And then when she joined, um, his numbers fell drastically and it no longer became a battleground state. So they picked up and we're going to the next state and they said, would you come with us? And I said, no, because my home is North Dakota. And I asked a bunch of people to volunteer their time to get this man um, elected. And it would be a, a shame for me. It would be embarrassing. I couldn't come home if I were to pick up and leave all these volunteers. So we continued, we organized under a more um, nonpartisan effort for get out the vote. We had a lot of, um, we had more access to public facilities because it wasn't partisan. And we just focused on getting people out there to vote. We thought that if, if um, and the theory goes, if you get people to vote in North Dakota on the reservations, they will vote Democrat. And overwhelmingly the numbers for 2008 were the highest participation at that time. Um, since then, the good work of yourself and many others um, have surpassed those participation participation numbers on the reservations, especially in the 2018 um, uh, push to get people to vote despite the, um, the hostile uh, legislation that came down from North Dakota requiring street addresses, which was a hot mess, a logistical hot mess, and, and they knew what they were doing. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. So, so, you know, I, I just volunteered and I, you know, put, after they left us, I, I felt like I, you know, it was like almost, almost freeing because we just, we just got to do things exactly how we wanted to. And uh, I would say that um, what catches the attention and, and it wasn't necessarily the president himself, it was the people that were working with him. Um, I just put my heart and my soul into the, the race. And then I kept track of numbers of like what our goals were, what we, um, what we met, how we did it, you know, how much um, people power it took, you know, gas cards were very helpful. Um, in a get out the road, get out the vote scenario, you can provide gas cards for drivers getting people to the polls. And that's all perfectly legal and everything. And we were we were by the book and and um, didn't have any dog bites, which is like a, a huge, um, uh, I would say, it's a feat um, in an election year to not have any dog bite dog bites when you're when you're doing um, canvassing. But I would say like we, you know, not just me. I would, it's, it's a total we situation. Um, but but reporting those results and talking to people about how we did it and my my sense was that if people knew that they if they hired capable um, grassroots people they were going to get results and i wanted to make sure they saw those results um, hire us we know our communities best will um, deploy what we know to work in indian country and your stuff your phone banking and all of that is is actually um, not as effective and it turns out it's not as effective for anyone <laughs> it's better to go door to door as ruth buffalo has proven um or knocking on over five thousand doors during her candidacy um and so that's that's how i think just putting that report back into the um the ethos of of you know this is what we did this is you hired me but this is what we did and these are the results um with with basically a report um, was to just try to make sure that they knew that the political the politicos that were running campaigns knew that it was an effective um, use of their resources because during campaigns it's it's very hard to get people to hire an individual let alone four individuals in a state like North Dakota um, and and I just wanted to make sure they knew that their resources were well spent. And then that led to a series of conversations um, with all the way to Cecilia Munoz, who had um, ultimately hired me a couple of weeks uh, before the inauguration. And so that's how I ended up um, 
eventually in the senior senior the role of senior policy for Native American Affairs. But I first started out in the public engagement and intergovernmental affairs office. Went to the uh, Department of Interior for a year, and then came back to the White House as um, the person in the Domestic Policy Council. Incredible journey, and I, I really feel your 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 role in the field in North Dakota um, laid some groundwork for the rest of us to build on um, in, in uh, uh, election cycles that in, engage native voters across the state. I mean, we started paying attention to our numbers in very different ways, especially through the party systems. Um, and we're able to have that same radical idea that we know our communities best and we serve our communities best when we're from those communities. and. Uh, we, 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 we got pushback on that idea um, and how we did it. I know my first year running Native Vote in North Dakota, we got a lot of pushback in, in that phone time and in the, 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 the measurables of, of, of some of these pieces that, that weren't working. I'm like, we need to go door to door. We need to be in our communities. We need to um, build relationship in, in a way that's building political power for us. So thank you for, for that work. An incredible journey, you know, getting to the White House. Can you share some of that with what your your work uh, brought you to? What kind of issues did you make a priority? So I would say that um, when I first got to the White House, because I was so, um, I would say green, the, I think anybody going into a place like the White House would consider themselves green because we all have specific areas, but I was green to the process out there with legislation. I, I think a lot of people go into those roles that having come from the Hill and having had that experience um, of like the, the popping issues and the, the things that get a lot of um, sunshine or, or le um, visibility. And I was, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't really pay attention to much of that uh, because the work previously was all about systems and systems change in the child welfare system, in the human service sector. Uh, before that, I was an economic development planner for my tribe, and I wrote grants. And I would say that um, looking at it from a system, system level, um, the, the role that I had at Native American Training Institute was really trying to bring greater visibility and voice to the children in the child welfare system. I would say, like, we did a lot of work, you know, with systems and um, mental health and uh, systems of care, um, wraparound services and, and that type of thing. But I would say central to our mission was really to how do we help the kids that are in the systems. And I would say that like that was a great grounding for me going into a place like the White House because I had visibility on how things worked on the ground for the most, um, I guess, the, the, the people who are most in need, I would say are children who are uh, caught in the system some in some way, shape or form. And there's, there's a big movement to try to give them as much voice over their own affairs. And I would say like that kind of thinking about who's on the other side of the table uh, grounded me because you know when you get into a position like that, there are a lot of people who come to you and want things from you and they'll say nice things about you um, and compliment you and say you're like the most wonderful thing. And, and that can kind of get to a person, you know, that can get to a person's head like, oh, I'm this and they need me to do that. And um, having so much experience on the ground, like I just knew that my reality was when I was working for a small nonprofit in North Dakota on, on children's issues, um, nobody said I was brilliant. Nobody said that I was um, the most wonderful thing in the world. It was like, I'm still the same person and I'm, I know I do good work, um, but you know, the, the platitudes and, and the, the kind of things that people want to do, it, it, it didn't really affect me that much. And I was 40 when I went. And so it was, it was like a little bit of a um, kind of like, what are these guys trying to do? Um, but, you know, nonetheless, it, it, it took a lot of, um, I guess, sorting in the beginning. I had to learn um, the patterns, you know, that the shifts in there, there's an ebb and a flow to DC, the you know, Congress meets, they convene and they do th these different things. And when they're um, pretty much obstructing the agenda of the president, which was the case for six of his eight years, um, it's pretty easy to get, you know, kind of um, think that there's not much you can do, but with rulemaking and budgets, you can move a lot. Uh, so a lot of it was like drinking from a fire hose on issues and getting ground, you know, getting the 
um, understanding of what was happening, the different stakeholders. It's, you know, it was like a lot of fast learning. And the, the thing that really took me um, out of my comfort zone in the campaign was when he talked about protection of sacred sites and um, preservation of our languages. And so the issues that really like drove me into politics were the ones that I found when I was in that position to be the hardest to work on. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a function of a lot of different things. But um, I would say the cultural uniqueness of Indian tribes and how we look at the sacred and, and what we've been through in terms of the genocide um, of our cultures throughout history, how, you know, it puts us in a very unique place. Like we don't have allies, like, you know, usually look for your ally, allies to move things. And um, those two things are, are, are and will continue to be difficult places that, that we'd have to move. Um, you know, we, we, we still continue to face uh, loss of language at incredible rates. We still have, you know, Oak Flats, we have Dakota Access Pipeline, we have a lot of different projects, uh, Mauna Kea, um, the wall down at Donna Atom, and um, the, the different people that have been, the Kumie that have been fighting it down there. There's, there's a lot of places where um, our interests to protect the sacred run up against um, big industry or even unions in some cases. Um, and that makes it difficult for, um, for us. And so we, you know, historically we've not had our voices. Um, uh, we haven't had a lot of say in what happens to us. And um, that's that's the difficulty. But I would say, you know, those those were the two issues that really um, were a priority, and I didn't get as far. I didn't get very far on on either of them. Yeah, I I, I can see the the need for that um, that education piece where we're operating on a completely different level and context when it comes to American history, and not just our relationship to the land, but because of the the the, the way that you, the United States government has um, exerted its authority over um, and with our peoples, uh, a lot of education needs to happen at that congressional level, at the federal level um, with so many. Um, I have a question about the education piece later, but I want us to get into this administration too and political appointees. So the, the Biden administration uh, has introduced perhaps probably the most diverse slate of political appointees across the country. And many positions have gone to native leaders from the Department of Interior to the Department of Transportation, Energy, White House personnel are just some of the areas that I'm aware of. Um, I'm sure there's many more um, and, and within your own role as well, serving with the White House. Does it make a difference having a native person in these roles? And, and what qualities do you value within those positions? So it, it does make a difference. And I think, um, I think the, the biggest difference that it makes is that you're not forgotten. Um, and this is something that I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase what Barack Obama or President Obama, Obama said about Native issues. It's that, it's not that, um, it's not that a lot of, some of the, like a lot of the policy in the beginning was definitely malicious. Um, but, you know, nowadays it's not that people want to do harm to native people it's just they don't they don't know what to do and they don't remember to ask they don't remember they're like oh yeah native native issues and i've heard from a couple of the people that were on the landing teams with, that are in the obama or the biden administration now that the groundwork that happened at the obama administration of people remembering to include tribes remembering to ask that it's the biggest thing is like I think Tracy Stevens was the one who would always say, don't forget tribes, like in whatever you're doing, just ask the question, how do tribes feel about this? And it's going to be different than what you typically would imagine if you don't ask. And, and this could be on any issue like of, you know, national importance the, that you'd ask anybody else, what do you, what do you think of this? Or what do you think of that? Do you want to be included in this spending package? How do treaty rights, how are treaty rights impacted by 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 the health care the affordable care act like how you know what is the what are the nuances there how does the affordable care act fit into the obligations that come that start back you know with the snyder act and 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 how the treaties treaty annuities were fulfilled from the very beginning of the country and so like having exactly what you need 
um, you know, in these different roles, if if a person is in in a, a let's say an outreach role or a policy role or a, you know at policy roles, some of them are decision makers. Um, but usually your boss has to put his name to it or her name to it. And so you have to like give them the best information and the best recommendation possible. Um, I'm not, I, I would say that I don't consider myself a political force because I've never run for office. And I think like people who have been an elected leader have a different kind of perspective on what's happening within the White House. And that's something that, um, you know, I think like being a native person in there you just constantly remind people that it visibly and physically um, to ask that question of, of don't forget the tribes, don't forget Native Americans, or how are you going to include um, Native Americans? And it, it's, it seems kind of binary in the beginning, and it, it is, and then there's the how. So do you want to be included or not? Yes or no? Yes then how, or do you wanna be, do you wanna not be included, then how? And some of the stuff about not being included is because sometimes we get, we get included in places that don't really fit with being a government. You know, being, being the units of government, sometimes we get um, over, like there's overreach, there's federal overreach. And so we don't wanna be included in some of that, um, some of the, some of the laws. And, and it goes back to the treaties, it goes back to, what we've explicitly, um, you know, been stripped of by Congress, or what we've agreed to through the treaties. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. I do believe representation goes beyond just the visibility of having us in those positions. It's it's about the work, and it's about those relationships, and it's about uh, how we're working within the communities as well. So yes, we we want to be in those rooms where and how and uh, when we can. So. So, and you, you were saying like, you had the question of what qualities um, do I value in these positions? The, the qualities that we need for people in these positions, first of all, they shouldn't just be, we shouldn't just be doing native kind of out, you know, native specific positions. Like the more experience we get into these other types of roles, um, the better the, the better off we are. And, and um, that just, it gives us another level of insight of how, how government works and how power works, but frankly, um, within these administrations. And I think that um, the value that, the values that I think that are important in these, in these positions are to have um, unbridled fear. <laughs> I mean, un, unbridled um, courage, not fear, but have, have a ton of, a ton of courage because um, th like the way that I approached being there was that, you know, I'm, I'm going into the belly of the beast and we need to fight um, for as much as we, as much as we can get during this time. We can, we've got to make, make our voices known. And so being fearless um, is, is about stating your truth and not being afraid to. And, and I think that like there's a there there's somewhat of a misconception because we have the the Bureau of Indian Affairs and we have Indian Health Service and we have the proximate federal presence throughout Indian Country. But when you go into these positions, it isn't to it isn't to self preserve. It's to get stuff done. Yeah. And you're not going to get stuff done if you're asking for half of what you think people want. Like you just ask for the full thing. Like just do as much as you can. And I think one example of this was um, some of the tribal leaders came in and they wanted to meet with somebody in OMB about this contract issue that was in litig litigation. And so they said, could we, could you get us a meeting with, with OMB? And so we got the the head of OMB to meet with the tribal leaders. And they were like, what is going on? We thought you were going to give us some lowly person. And we were meeting with the, the head of OMB. And, and I was like, well, why wouldn't you meet with the head of OMB? You're the head of all your nations. Like this is where we, this is the starting point. We shouldn't be starting and trying to work our way up. If we can get high level meetings with decision makers who can, you know, meaningfully change the way that they're approaching things. Um, that's better. Like this was always a high level issue. And eventually, you know, um, I, I don't think that we were victorious in like the tribes didn't get the OMB to shift exactly the courts made them, but they were well aware of it from the very beginning because of those for, um, initial interactions. So I, I would say being, you know, 
the other thing is that like, if you have, like, I, I am not somebody who would, I think like working for a tribe is, is almost like it, it's almost like a prerequisite working for a tribe or an organization working in community, like going, going straight from school and not having that grounded experience. I know people like my friend, uh, Mark Cruz was a uh, teach for America in Rosebud. And then he went into, you know, his work in, in, on the Hill and then ended up in, um, the Trump administration, good friend of mine, like his, the, the basis of what he understood the world to be would be totally different if he didn't go and work in Rosebud, completely different. And I think even growing up in our communities, if you're not, if you're not working on them, you'd have no idea how hard it is to get things done. How many rules, how many barriers, how many territorial siloed like insanity things that happen at the ground level if you don't have that grounding I think that it's it's hard and that can be in any like level like litigating like there's a ton of people who went through law school and and then they they try to get things with tribes and they're like this is so this system is not it's so not fair it's it's so unjust and I think just having that experience I think it's really valuable before you go in and certainly when you go in, you're going to hear it all. Um, you're going to hear everything, but you know, it is, it's, it's really important again, you know, to be fearless and then, uh, to be grounded in practice in some way, shape or form. I appreciate that. That's a great story too, where, you know, that self viability of a, of an elected tribal chair, um, understanding that you're a head of state and you should be meeting with the head of the uh, office of management and budget right like the office of head of omb because they should be throwing you um a state dinner when you come visit washington dc every time as an executive of a tribe as a sovereign nation right like we have to understand that we have this autonomy as our own governments meeting with this other government and yeah. our sovereignty um is upheld and should be respected which uh leads me to my next question though too is like sovereignty of our tribal nations has is consistently under attack and was constantly under attack within the previous administration. Are you seeing um, a difference in having representation from all these tribal communities in these political appointments? Or do you think we will see a difference being made because there's so many um, diverse tribal nations within these political appointments? Um, I th I'm sure, I'm positive there's, there's change. I mean, there's already change in the first days of, of what President, Ob President Biden did. Um, and, you know, with the Keystone, uh, Anwar, Bears Ears, you know, all of those, those statements of action um, are huge. They're, they're massive in, in the way that we're being, you know, some of the, the issues that we consider like top of, um, top of the deck, you know, are being elevated in the first days. So, I, and I think that was the case during the, um, also during the um campaign um there's good people inside you know julia rodriguez i worked with her she's the head of ope there's you know a number of people who are who are maybe not native but they're allies and they're in really good positions of being um you know with 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 the story of um you know changing the narrative on how the united states works with native americans and indian tribes it doesn't have to be so hard um, and how how can we get how can we get change things systemically and not just on an issue to issue basis on a a one off? Yeah, well, in understanding too, like the long term game too. I mean, uh, you know, DAPO was ten years. You know, um, the the conversation around Bears Ears, I think, was even almost twelve years old, if not a little bit younger. But um, you know, all of these conversations were under the, you know, even under your tenor. Um, at the White House and how long it's taken to get to movement and environmental justice orgs and other places um, becoming accomplices within the, the, the that change to um, put pressure on these governments and the administration to uh, to hold with sacred sacred. Um, and I know with the environmental justice movement and our indigenous communities, we played a pretty significant role in uh, Deb Holland being nominated for the Secretary of the Department of Interior. Can you share any thoughts on this historic nomination and the potential this role has? 
Well, I, th I think there's, I, I just want to make a couple of corrections. Um, Dapple was only, is only five years old. Oh, um, God, yeah, God. like it would be six. Um, 2014, no, I'm sorry, 2015 was when they decided to change the route. And, and so that was like, it was in, in the works, but it was like always being cited north of Bismarck until just like suddenly in September of 2016 um, or 2000 and yes, 2015, they changed routes. And so like when that route shifted, then, then the, the battles began. Um, and, you know, technically, technically I wasn't in the White House, but Definitely, I felt the responsibility of not doing enough to systemically to, to address these types of things. Um, and and Bears Ears did get a national monument designation, which I did work on when I was in the White House um, during the Obama administration. But uh, in terms of the environment, environmental justice movement, I mean, I think the, the collision of what has happened because of COVID in bringing to surface a lot of the social justice issues, um, you know, based on the, the, the overwhelming activism um, fighting for justice um, for Black Lives Matter. It, it's, it's been extremely important um, within the environmental justice movement because they've been also having self-reflection, a time of self-reflection on how they can be better allies. Um, on this front, and it it is definitely um, time for a different kind of leadership in that in that cabinet space. Um, the the nomination of Deb Haaland is one of the one of the brightest spots of the Biden administration thus far, because he's not only surpassed uh, what um, the his predecessors have done, but he's he's bringing a, a native voice to the highest decision making power um, body in in the federal government uh, as a cabinet. And when you're a cabinet men member opposed to like being in domestic policy council, it's two different things. You're just on a you have budgets, you have staff, you have um, you know con Congress has given you a charge to. Um, can you know have have certain areas in you know in lock and you know getting things done, um, and I and I just can't express how pivotal it's going to be for for our issues um, because being having a seat at that table takes it to a whole different level. At much like it has on the congressional front, having um, the representative Halland and representative um, Sharice Davis on you know as members of Congress, we we also have. You know, um, Representative Tom Cole, um, uh, Representative um, Mark Wayne um, from from Oklahoma, and uh, so I think that like having people in those roles, you get to you get to see. I mean, I've, I'm a huge fan of um, bipartisanship, uh, and bipartisanship was alive and well. I, I always said that we were the best kept best kept secret in the Beltway that we would have really conservative congressmen on our side when it came to defending our women, um, you know, people that are unusual suspects. And that came from the bipartisanship that's built around Native issues. I was watching the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs today and just the, um, it was so, they were, everybody was so collegial. They were so kind and they were so in honor of each other from, you know, Senator Tester to when he nominated um, Senator Murkowski as vice chair, like there's, there is a genuine heartfelt, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Senator Heidkamp, former Senator, Senator Heidkamp. There's a heartfelt connection that people have um, as members of Congress on these issues. And you see it in the Senate, you see it in the House. And um, this is, this is an opportunity because Deb was a part of those bipartisan conversations with, with people like um, Representative Cole, who's, you know, in, he's, he's part of leadership on, uh, in the House, on the Republican side. And a lot of this stuff isn't, isn't something that, um, when you're a successful secretary, it's when you're able to um, create change that is lasting through legislation. So I think like her role and her record as a member of Congress has been um, very, very um, positive and you know, I have a lot of hope for what's to come um, in her role as a Secretary of Interior.
Oh, I absolutely agree too. And and speaking of that education piece, even when you served um, within the White House, there seemed to be a need for so much education just to get folks on our level of understanding on context and history. Um, kind of, I like to call it Indian 101 um, and oh, so many other levels uh, that's, that's needed um, in regards to these positions and what their roles are, but, and then who we are as a community and our people and how to best meet our needs. But there's still a lot of education that's needed on why Representative Holland should be in this role and, and um, within Indian country and with the general public. What, if you had a few minutes to share with folks about her serving as Secretary of uh, Interior, would you want our communities and the general public to know? About her role as Secretary? Oh, yes, yes, sorry. So, I mean, this is this is historic because it is the agency or it is the department that oversees the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And oftentimes, um, I mean, this isn't this is the the environment of scarcity. So when we have issues that run up against other issues, um, like in budget talks, like it's important to have somebody there who understands the nuances of what the, the agencies are, are asking. And I think she's well positioned because she's not only Pueblo from her community, um, she's, she's been in Congress, she's worked on a number of these issues, but she's also worked on a ton of environmental issues. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs is one part of the, the Department of the Interior and the part, Department of Interior has the National Park Service. It has USGS, the Geological Survey Service who monitors earthquakes across the across the globe <laughs> and then you have um uh the fish and wildlife service you have the um i already said national park service um the bureau of land management you have the bureau of Rec reclamation all of these different public lands functions that are critical to how the nation manages its ability to protect the environment and to preserve um, things like Yellowstone or the Yosemite or um, Joshua Tree or any of the places that have that are um, the jewels of of the United States. This is this is part of her role. I think um, what people what what people and, and this is this is a macro kind of commentary that I'm about to make. This is not something that um, is probably what I don't know if people think about this but when I was in the <laughs> when I was in the White House I'd be like why are we why are we having this these discussions and why are we in the zero-sum game with grizzly bears like why are we still in the Department of the Interior how is it that we as people are being pitted against environmental issues when it comes to budget that doesn't seem fair and it's also quite dehumanizing in if you look, if you step back and you look at it, like why are we with the rocks and the streams? And it, it's it's not um, it's a relic for you know interior to have that role, uh, but it's also we've also kind of lived with this like we you know they stuck us in there and then you know we have a lot of land and they deal with a lot of land so yeah they go there, um, you know agriculture has a lot of land too so why aren't we over there? <laughs> <laughs> they have more money, they have a bigger budget, um, but we're in this zero sum game of about 14 billion in with EPA, it's interior and EPA. Um, and so it's important to have people at the table who are understanding these, these different kinds of like human types of issues. You know, historically people have had to learn them once they get in that role. Um, so it is something that, you know, I, I see Congresswoman Hallen coming into the role um, knowing that like we've, we've, you know, fought a lot of battles and a lot of times we don't win. And so maybe some of this is part of the reckoning that the United States is going through on social justice, because we really haven't, um, we really haven't had our own and there, there, like you said, there's a difference between representation and people with authority. Um, she certainly will have more authority than anyone besides the, the CA vice, vice president, um, you know, at the turn of the century, at the turn, turn of the 21st century. So um, I'm, I'm just really excited and elated that she would be there and she's going to do incredible things. I think 
as far as like how people can be supportive of her, she is getting a hold by Senator Danes. You could call anybody from Montana should call their senator and ask him to remove the hold. Um, she's going to need support from a lot of states that are we're mostly you know we have a big percentage of the population montana north dakota south dakota um arizona like all of those places where they're i guess arizona is is not that it's the red states that are going to be um um hesitant or trying to peg her as too progressive or or to this or to that and questioning her qualifications which is frankly unfortunate and a reflection of the offices more so than um, her her standing and her her ability to do this work. Yeah, I agree with that. And that actually leads into my final question for you um, this evening with with um, Representative Holland. You know, how can we f support her in her role as a secretary of the Department of Interior? And um, even, I mean, how can we support all of the native political appointees, but specifically around that education piece, but providing support um, as the public as they go into this um, new service? Well, I, you know, how do we support political appointees? I mean, it's our job to keep them doing their job. <laughs> so being supportive is also being all truthful. And, and um, it doesn't mean that they're not going to, we're not going to win them all. Like we have to, part of our help to them is, is helping them see co things coming to them that are going to be difficult decisions that they can help get some energy under. And so that they can avert danger and disaster. A lot of what's in in, rolled up in these in these issues is like very tangled, litigious, um, um, complex problems. But we want to be a lot of times people will assume, well, they're going to think this or they're going to think that the best thing is to have open communications. And if you're not involved in some of the advocacy, there's a, there's a ton of advocates that are or advocacy coalitions and groups, like whether it's on education or it's on health, you have the National Indian Health Board, NIEA, you have all of these different um, associations that if you're involved in them and you're um, you know, telling them what, what you need, what kind of policy changes are, priority, are a priority, then they're in theory supposed to work, work their way to the um, people that are in these political appointees. But if you know people going in, you know, just, you know, send them notes like people sent me like every relative I know, like everyone sent me what they thought. And it was actually helpful. It's not nobody you get really inundated and it gets you get busy, but you can support people by being, you know, sort of their eyes and their ears and, and like help them to see things maybe they are not able to see from DC. And then also like when it comes to, you know, Representative Helen, it's it's really critical to just call senators and tell them to just appoint her like vote for vote for Deb Holland and there should be no um there should be no issue on the confirmation it shouldn't be a challenge we just all have to stand with her and get her through and then that honesty of like we're not going to get our way 100% of the time so we've got to let them know that you know they're not um they, they've got to be better than the than what came before and that's better than not just Trump's administration but all previous administrations if we're really going to make gains on these systemic um issues around uh treaty crimes <laughs> and uh you know complete you know afterthought of of what Native American policy has been um since contact yeah for real Oh man, I want to talk to you so much longer, Jody. But I know it's getting late, and we kind of make a commitment to 40, 45 minutes of a conversation. But in in closing, uh, is there anything else that you want to share with us before we we wrap this up? Well, well, I just want to say that um, you know, in gratitude for everybody who got out and voted. And this is civic engagement isn't just about voting, it's about participation as well. People don't think that by calling their senator, they're gonna make a difference. They have logs of people who call their senators. And if you flood their, their phone lines, they actually have that on their readout. And the, the first thing in the morning, this number of people called on this issue. And it's the same thing if you want, you know, you want to put your writing to the White House, putting your comments in, like participating in rulemaking in comment periods for 
um, budgets for all of these different things that are happening, it's 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 critical. I mean, there, that this is the, the the work of the citizen, and it does matter. Every bit of it matters, um, big or small, and not. It isn't, and this is what I try to remind people. It isn't about getting one of these roles. It's about like we are better if we're part. We're we're giving input that's better than if we all decide that that's somebody else's job, especially if it's something that's close to your heart and you're, you're passionate about. And you know, I'm I'm back in the no dapple stuff, so I'm you know closing. I hope that they shut that pipeline down. It's it's way past. I was reading some of the commentary from 2016, it's just way past time. If, if, if this administration stands for environmental justice, um, do the right thing, shut it down. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Jody, and thank you all for tuning into our We Belong Here series where we highlight Native American political leaders, Native political leaders from across the country and their insight into the roles that they serve or have served and how we can be better citizens as well and engage. So thank you so much all for your time. Jody, you have a great rest of your night and great rest of your weekend. Um, and thank you all and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for doing this, Bray.